Okay, so I'm going to use this example to talk about how to use the university waveform viewer. Okay, um, so here I have a project that I've designed using the block diagram schematic capture. Um, this is a serial adder subtractor. Okay, I have my full adder here and some serial registers that are going to be um, used here. And now you can see I have a number of inputs and outputs and all kinds of things that I need to sort of take care of. And um, the first thing you want to do is make sure that whichever file you're using, you want to make sure you set that as the top level entity and you run the analysis and synthesis on that. Um, that will make sure that you can properly do your simulations. Um, in this case, I this particular project, I'm simulating several different things. So I only have one file at the top of my hierarchy. Um, if you have a hierarchical design, then what you would do is you would set your top level here and, and each of these would fall underneath it in the hierarchy. So you can see here that in my hierarchy, I have my serial processor, adder subtractor, and each of the components are listed there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to File, New, and I'm going to scroll down here to the University Program VWF, and this is going to bring up the waveform here. Okay, And what I'm going to do is I'm going to first uh, establish uh, the variables that I'm going to use. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to, now you could do this, I typically could do this by right clicking. When I go to insert node or bus and instead of trying to type every single one of those inputs and outputs because there were so many of them, we have the node finder here and on the node finder if we click list this will pull all of the inputs and outputs from the compiled design and I'm going to use all of them in my waveform. So I'm going to copy all nodes and hit OK hit OK, and that's going to give me each of my inputs and outputs over here. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time reorganizing these. So I have A and B, and these are already grouped for me, and these are grouped because they were grouped in the original design. If we go back and look at the design here, okay, A and B are already grouped as, um, as a bus. I'll try to zoom in here. A, they're already a bus, right? A of 3, A of 2, A of 1, A of 0. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to go back to my waveform. So those are automatically grouped for me. Now, what I didn't do, just to show you how grouping works, is if you look at my output, my output I did not group. All right. So I could have done Q bracket 3, Q bracket 2 for my output, but I decided not to so I could show you how we do the groupings. So these are going to be my A and my B. These are going to be the inputs um, that get loaded into my serial registers for the addition. Add sub is the input that controls whether I'm adding or subtracting, and the clock. And then here are my four outputs. Now, if you're going to be grouping these, I recommend that you sort them by clicking and dragging each of them into the correct order so that the most significant bit is on the top and the least significant bit is on the bottom. And what you can do is then you can either use control or shift as you select these. And then again, you can either do a right click grouping here, or you could do edit grouping group and I'm going to group these as my sum. Now I have the radix in binary right now. We could change that later, but since I'm going to be doing an adder subtractor, I'm going to change this to sine decimal. Now you can see that it's been grouped. If we need to expand it, we could do that later. And since it's the sum, I'm going to move it to the bottom. Okay. I'm also going to come in here and establish that uh, A and B so I can select these individually and change their radix to sine decimal, or I could select them at the same time and change their radix to sine decimal, right? So that's either right click or edit radix, sine decimal on those, okay? Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a basic math. Now we need a clock. And what I'd recommend is that when you're setting up the simulation, that the first thing you figure out is how long you wanna set this simulation up for, because this is gonna be writing your test bench for you. So the first thing I typically do is I set an end time. And since I have a four bit adder, I need at least five clock cycles that I'm gonna work with because I need one clock cycle to load the values into the adder and then four to shift through the serial adder. So I'm gonna do 50 nanoseconds. And then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna edit the grid size so that each point in the grid here that I can select is 10 nanoseconds long. So now each of these becomes a clock cycle. Okay. Uh, I need to add the clock. So if I select the clock here, I can either use the stopwatch 
command right here, or I believe edit insert, no, sorry, value arbitrary, uh, sorry, overwrite clock right here. And I want a 10, since my period, I want my period to line up with 10 nanoseconds. I want a 50% duty cycle. I click OK. And now I have a nice clock done out for me for the entire simulation time. Okay. Um, I'm going to do a subtraction. So I'm going to select this and I'm going to set this to one. So I know I'm doing subtraction, right? That's the way the serial adder works is a zero is an addition and a one is a subtraction. I do have, if you look here on the design, there are a number of clear. So I do want to clear all my registers. They are active low clears, which are connected to the reset command. So I need to do an active low reset. But the thing is, if I leave reset low the whole time, like it is now, it will actually cause the system to just stay at zero all the time. This is the asynchronous reset for all the flip flops and registers. So what I need to do is I need to make sure that this goes to a one. But if I do it this way, then they never get reset. Now you could think about selecting this one grid piece and making that a zero. But the problem is by doing that, you're resetting through your first clock cycle, which is OK. But you then you'd have to make sure you'd have to add an additional clock cycle. So what we'd really like to have happen is for the reset to occur before the first rising clock edge for these flip flops. And so what I need to do is I need to go to turn off snap to grid. What this will allow me to do, right, is select any piece of this line now. I don't have to select an entire segment. So I can simply just select the rest of this, set it to a one here. So you can either select the one here or you can do edit value force high like that. And now you can see that my reset will occur right at the beginning of operation, but it is now disabled uh, for each of my clock cycles. So I don't have to worry about that. Uh, the last two things I want to set the values for the two control bits S0 and S1, which control the shifting operation. Uh, I'm going to turn back on snap to grid because I only want to select them in, in, in segments of the grid. So you can either select one grid, grid segment or multiple. You could do multiple grid segments, right? Um, so the way this adder subtractor works is that when the, com when the controls are one, one, it will load values. So I'm going to set the first two bits to be one, one. And in that time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to parallel load values into A and B. All right, so I'm going to pick them one at a time. I'm going to select this and this is where I'm, now because it's an adder and I'm only doing the parallel load once every five, I can either only parallel load here. Technically, I could do it. I could keep the parallel load input value the same for the entire time, but I guess um, it, it doesn't really matter, but I'll do it for the entire. I'll do it for for each here just to show you. Um, but for this one, I'm going to make it um, I need to do an arbitrary value. So that allows me to pick. So that's the question mark here or edit value. Arbitrary value. And since I'm in sign decimal, I could pick any number. Now it's four. It's a four bit signed. So I can go anywhere from minus eight up through seven. So I'm going to do five. OK, so you can see here that a will now have a value of five. And if you expand this, you could see that it is zero one zero one, which is our binary number five. For B here, there's a number of things you can do. You can actually use this R value or, or edit value um, random values, and it will just pick random values for it. That's useful if you're doing like a test of, uh, you know, when you're you're trying to test lots of different different combinations for like a combinational logic. But I'm just going to put in my own value here with the question mark. And since this is signed, I could actually do, I'm doing a subtraction. Now I have to be careful because if I do five minus minus three, that's going to give me an overflow error. So I'm going to pick five minus minus two. OK, which will give me seven when I finally finish this. So I have five minus minus two. You can see here that this is one, 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 zero, which is negative two and two's complement. So it does that for me. All right. And now I just need to do the operation. So this when I perform this operation, it will load five and minus two into my two registers and then add sub will take care of the subtracting. And then what we need to do is we need to shift through A and B here. So if I come back here, what we're going to do is we're going to take the least significant bit out of A and the least significant bit out of B. And we're going to subtract. You're going to do our subtraction through the full adder. And so we'll take this one. And then what we'll do is we'll have to shift through each of the four bits in A and each of the four bits in B. 
while at the same time shifting through the sum so that we load the least significant bit, then the next least, then the next, and then finally the most significant bit into the sum. So that means we need to do four shift operations. Okay, so according to the data so sheet, do now, I'm going to make sure that one shifts nine to the right chips. And so the S1 right shift already has the load command. Uh, the, the load command occurs here when S0 and S1 are is zero, here, and, and S0 in order to is shift, one. I need the rest. So I'm going to go back S0 to my waveform to become one. Okay, so at this point, I've now properly configured my simulation, so I can now save it. Okay, now here are some important caveats that we have with the waveform editor. One is that when you do a save on this, every time you save it, you need to make sure you update the test bench files. So what I mean by that is when I go to hit save, right now the name of my adder is waveform2, okay? But if I say I want to save this as a, as a different name, say I want to save this as, you know, um, add sub waveform. Okay, that's perfectly fine. Just be careful not to start it with a number and make sure, sure not to use any special characters other than underscores in your name here. And I'm going to save it here right alongside all my other files in here. If you went and you looked at all the files in here, you know, this is where my BDF block diagrams are and all the things. I'm going to save those right here. Save it right here. Now, what I've just done in this case, before I can simulate, I actually have to go into the simulation settings. And if you look at the simulation settings, the work directory here is set to waveform 2. And what you would have to do is actually go in and edit any instance of waveform 2 and change it to what I named it, which is add sub, uh, what I call it, add, add sub waveform, right? But the nice thing is there's a restore defaults button here. Ah, see, that automatically changes that, okay? If you do are doing a timing simulation, it also corrects that. Now, there's one other issue that has been persistent with the waveform viewer for a while, and that is this Novop uh, uh, operation here. This needs to be deleted, okay? Um, for some reason that I cannot explain, um, that was included in an older version, but it has yet to be removed from sort of the standard settings, and so it does need to be deleted. Again, if you're doing a timing si simulation, you need to delete that, but if you're not doing a timing simulation, then you only have to edit one of these two. Once that's done, we can now finally run our functional simulation. It will ask you to save it again um, after you've edited those settings. But we run our functional simulation. It creates a test bench for us. It goes through the operation here using model sim. And you can see that at the end of my operation, I have five minus two loaded into A and B. I'm subtracting them. Five minus minus two is seven. And you can see that as the sum comes into the final shift register, zeros, minus eight, minus four, minus two, and then finally, the correct answer at the end of four shift operations is seven. So that is the way that we take advantage of the simulation waveform editor to build test benches for us without having to write any code.